will be before the day is out, I trust you. <laughs> My name's Steve West. I'm uh, an amateur historian for the 29th. Uh, I've been into the 29th for about 25 years. That's four times longer than the actual war lasted, believe it or not. I've worked on Saving Private Ryan and Band of Brothers. I've earned many credentials amongst you. My interest here on Hill 108 began about 10, 15 years ago from a late veteran friend of mine called Sam Alsop. Sam Alsop was wounded on Hill 108 quite badly. He ended his war effectively. And he wrote a book called Hedgerow Hell. Hedgerow Hell, sorry if you hear the same jokes again, sorry. Hedgerow Hell was written in a peculiar style, which I call Sanglish. Sam's book was then translated into French, and as far as we can gather, it was taken, translated from French back into English. So it doesn't read very well, it doesn't make much sense. So I got to know Sam very closely trying to unpick what was written. Over the years I've been to the archives, I brought out all the combat reports, procured the maps to try and piece together what happened here. And it's an awkward situation. There's an old joke that goes, a man with one watch knows the time. A man with two watches never will, because there'll always be a slight variation. And it's the same with combat records. There'll always be a slight twist or slight difference between them all. So what I'll give you today is a synthesis to the best of my understanding of what went on. There may be one or two slight differences which you may be aware of. Please tell me if you're aware of them. Right, where we stood now, St. Lowe is three miles down that road. The 175th, or the 1st Battalion, are coming down this road, this way. Now, to understand why the fight took place here, you have to understand what had happened to the 175th. They'd landed on D plus one, and as the rest of the 29th are pushing down south, from Omaha, and you've got the 4th, the 9th, and the 90th pushing east, you have a large wedge forming, pointing at Isigny. In this wedge, there is known to be the Gotts von Berlich Ingen. That's the 17th SS. Now, what General Gerhard doesn't want to do is move all his men down and have the SS punch in behind him all the way back to the beaches. So as the 175th uh, sorry, as the 29th the part coming down, he's got the 175th coming in filling. They stay there for a period which I call making it stick, which is the awkward period between D-Day and the drive for St. Lowe. This is why this battle tends not to be covered very much, because it tends to get missed by historians very easily. What they don't understand is that here was why one of the five distinguished unit citations was earned for the division and also the Croix de Guerre was awarded. It's the site of a very, very bloody fight in a very intense period. So, in the period between D-Day and the breakout for St. Lowe, more divisions are pouring on land. We've got the 2nd Armoured, the 30th Division, the 35th Division, more and more guys coming in, which then frees up the 175th to continue their drive south with the rest of their buddies. What's happened though, is the 175th have found a chink that runs down the side of the Vera River towards St. Lowe. And when they move out on June the 15th, they're able to make quite a phenomenal rate, at least four kilometers, which in the Battle of the Hedgerows way of speaking is is like Formula One racing. Unfortunately, the period where they've been holding up and stopping the Germans getting behind them has allowed the 352nd Division, the 29th arch enemy, to lick their wounds and recover. They've also been able to use this time to bring up the 353rd Division under their regimental commander, uh, the, the 353rd Division with the regiment, the 943rd Regiment under called Kampfgruppe Bohm, after the regimental commander. So what we have here is the 175th coming down and running head on into the Germans. The 
battle starts oh probably about half a mile that way and gradually works forward. What well, we, we, we estimate the date was when you were down there? It was June the 16th, okay. down by that junction. Where we're stood now is the morning of the 17th of June. But in the distance between there and here, it started to stiffen up. The Germans have started to put up more resistance and more fighting. We've now got a German flak unit. Company B, 49th Flak Battalion. These guys have 88 caliber guns, which are anti-aircraft guns, which have now been turned horizontal. And I'm sure if you sit and listen to the veterans, they'll tell you horror stories of 88s that make your hair curl. Those are 88. 88s, yeah. So, from the 16th back there to the 17th, the resistance has started increasing. The regimental commander, Colonel Alexander George, becomes wounded. He's busy taking out the German machine gun position and playing tag with German stick grenades. The Germans throw a machine uh, stick grenade back, he picks it up, it goes to hurl it back and it goes off. So he loses his right eye on the tip of his nose. But he does make it back to the division back in January 1945 in the 115th. We've also lost the battalion exec, Anthony Miller. We've also lost company A commander, Joseph Mueller. Joseph Mueller was wounded back at the next junction and had been shot up by the Germans who'd actually begun to penetrate in behind. So the Germans are already beginning to squeeze in on the 175th from several sides. Joseph Mueller, we understand, was hit by a shell burst and the Germans got up close enough to hit him with several rounds of machine gun fire, but he survived. The fighting continued slowly up to about here. And on June the 17th, they decided they were going to go forward. It's, uh, we need to walk up the, up the road. It's only a little way, if you, you're okay. If we can just go that way. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> 